Hey everyone, welcome back to RPG Imaginings. Got a package in the mail today that I'm very excited to show you, and it's a very thick package, and it contains the update to a product that I have been anticipating for a very, very long time. Those of you who follow Call of Cthulhu know that Call of Cthulhu is in its seventh edition. It had a major Kickstarter reboot a couple of years ago, and Chaosium, the company that makes Call of Cthulhu, has been churning out product uh, after product just gorgeous hardcover full color books to update uh, uh, a lot of their old product line, but they've also been coming out with a lot of new supplements as well. And so there's been a really nice balance for people who don't have a lot of the older classic Call of Cthulhu supplements. There's an opportunity for those of us who didn't uh, were, weren't collecting Call of Cthulhu and running Call of Cthulhu products for a while to get some of those old products. Now, I've been inspired over the last couple of years with 7th edition. This is not something I expected. I've been inspired to collect a lot of the old Call of Cthulhu products. I had Call of Cthulhu six, uh, edition 5.5 from uh, over a decade ago, and it had been sitting on my shelf, and I had always wanted to run a Call of Cthulhu game, but I never really had the opportunity to do it. And uh, just over the last year or so, I've had an opportunity to run Call of Cthulhu 7th edition uh, a lot more frequently for, for uh, several different groups, um, both in a uh, friend group that I meet every September for a non-conventional game convention that we do, and then also a group of just exclusive Call of Cthulhu gamers that I've been uh, running a steady campaign with uh, some of the classic adventures as well. So what I'm going to be unboxing for you today is one of those... Um, classic campaigns for Call of Cthulhu that many of us have been anticipating for a very, very long time. And so, you know what, let's just cut to the chase. Now, part of the reason why this box is so large is because Chaosium is known for doing a really great job patch packaging their materials. And you can see there was a little bit of a... Um, opening of the box here, but I don't think that that has likely damaged any of the contents of the box at all. Took about a week to get to me because Chaosium uh, saves money on shipping for you by uh, packing items, um, or shipping items, I should say, uh, via a cheaper form of uh, post. And so we have some cardboard here. Okay, get that packing slip out of the way so that my address is not on there. So this this cardboard is a is a nice thing that's keeping this box secure. They always do a spectacular job of packaging their products. Ever since I started ordering directly from Chaosium about a year ago, um, I was just amazed at how much work they put into this. And so um, you can see we have, wow, this is a big product, right? So I'm going to move the box out of the way. There was cardboard inside the box reinforcing the box itself. They always do a spectacular job with this. So we have some packaging on here. It's wrapped mummy style, which seems totally appropriate for this campaign. Um, and uh, what do we have here? Here it is. It's happening. It's what we've been waiting for. Wow. Masks of Nyarlathotep slipcase set. It's in this beautiful slipcase with the Carlisle Expedition. Um, I'm going to try to go spoiler-free for a little while, but um, I think even people who run this campaign will recognize early on that the Carlisle Expedition is the focus of the campaign. So I don't really consider that too big of a spoiler, okay? Because p uh, players who run through it will learn about that um, uh, right through the uh, first adventure of the campaign. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, the Crawling Chaos, Nyarlathotep, uh, one with a thousand faces. All right. Wow. Check this out. Two books. This is a huge campaign. Okay, this is 600 plus pages plus the Keeper screen pack. Of course, in Call of Cthulhu, the Game Master is called the Keeper. This was a really expensive product, but... Honestly, folks, this is a legacy product. Okay, this is something that I've invested in because this is a role playing p product that I have been anticipating for a very, very long time. And I don't buy a lot of role playing products, honestly. Okay, I, I really pick and choose largely to save money, okay, because I got a household that, that I'm trying to support as well. Uh, I really pick and choose what role playing products I invest in. I will admit. As a fairly successful professional, um, at least my I, I've been more successful over the last couple of years, 
I've had a little bit more disposable income that I'm able to put into my role-playing hobby, but I'm still pretty choosy about what I get. Like, I, I have to feel like I'm going to get a utility out of something in order to add it to my collection. So lately, I've been collecting Call of Cthulhu supplements. Here's the fourth edition of Masks of Nyarlathotep. came out in 2010. And I, there's a clear difference between older Chaosium products and the new ones that have been launched since the Kickstarter. Okay, so here we have, this is basically the same campaign, but it has been significantly fleshed out, a lot more how-to added to it compared to the most recent release in 2010, fourth edition of Masks of Nyarlathotep. This campaign is one of the most beloved campaigns, not only for Call of Cthulhu, but for role players in general. It has this sandbox style of... Uh, giving players the agency to choose where they go at what times in the adventure after like the initial uh, set of clues that they discover in their investigations. And when this first came out in the early 1980s, it was pretty revolutionary in that the word campaign is defined in role-playing games when they first started out was, you know, a series of scenarios that are connected together because we say we're connecting them together and we're going to drop little hints that there might be a reoccurring villain, something like that. Um, Masks of Nyarlathotep really took this to the next level of allowing players to really choose where they're going. There are more railroaded campaigns out there. Um, of course, by definition, Horrors on the Orient Express is literally railroaded, okay? But there is some choice even within Horrors on the Orient Express as well for Call of Cthulhu. And... Uh, if you think of uh, some of the campaigns from uh, classic Dungeons and Dragons, we're talking campaign in the loosest sense of the word, in that uh, fighting more monsters in a row over a series of adventures does not a campaign make. You want to have recurring villains. You want to have understand the motivations of the villains, have allies that you're understanding their motivations of. And so Masks of Nyarlathotep is a this beloved campaign because it sort of broke the, the initial mold of what players thought a campaign was. That it isn't just a bunch of scenarios that you do in an order. It is something where players have a lot of choice for crafting this scenario. This campaign is so beloved that uh, a group on uh worked on and produced a companion to it called the Masks of Nyarlathotep Companion, a 700-page companion that was released uh, as a physical book in a limited edition and then you can still buy the pdf today and that was sanctioned by chaosium the makers of call of cthulhu and so um when you're updating masks of nyarlathotep what do you do well one of the big criticisms of masks of nyarlathotep and you can see this when you read through earlier editions like fourth edition is that there's a lot of what but not a lot of how and what excites me so much about this product that I just unboxed since I've had the PDF since July is that there is so much more of the critical how that actually helps a game master run these series of adventures that that is just a really exciting aspect to this. So um, just to move this out of the side of the way for just a second, I just want to sort of show uh, a quick example from the fourth edition of what I'm talking about. So... Location of Carlisle Expedition Principles. This is a little spoilery. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but I just want to point out that there's, you know, a couple sentence blurbs about where they are and what they're doing at particular times at the start of the adventure. Okay. A key distinction between the older version of Masks of Nyarlathotep and the new 7th edition that was just released is that, you know, if you're really going to have a role-playing campaign that has some principal characters, NPCs that you're going to be following all through the campaign... The Game Master, the Keeper especially, needs to know a lot about what their motivations are, where they came from, what they care about, and that care that needs to be put into crafting a story with memorable characters who have their own motivations, based upon what I've read in the PDF, and I haven't gotten all the way through it, but I've been slowly chugging through it, is present here in Masks of Nyarlathotep 7th Edition. So let's bust this beast open! Freshly getting the shrink wrap off. Woo! This is an expensive product. Um, it's The slipcase set is $130, which, you know, is the most money I've ever spent on a single role-playing product. Um, there are, of course, hobbyists who 
put a ton of money in into their role playing hobby. I put more in the last three years than I had in my entire life <laughs> into my hobby. But you know, I have a little bit more uh, a disposable income. I have another YouTube channel called Clutch Situation um, that I get ad revenue from, and and that's funded some uh, not only my mechanical pencil hobby but this hobby as well. So here we go. Let's bust this open. The slipcase contains. Gosh, what's going to be the best way to take this stuff out? So there's a little bit of cardboard in here, okay, so that it stays nice while it's packed. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me, remove that. <clears throat> we have one full-color hardcover book. This is volume one of a two-volume series. Okay. And so this... Volume 1 contains the campaign introduction, which is a really fascinating section that I'll show you here in a section, uh, in a second. Peru is a newly added uh, segment to the campaign. Uh, information on starting the campaign, kicking it off after the prologue, if you choose to do the prologue. And then the America, England, and Egypt chapters are all contained within this book. Okay, so yeah, minor spoilers there. Okay, then we have the second volume. Full color hardcover book, Masks of Nyarlathotep Volume 2. We have the Crawling Chaos on the cover, beautiful artwork. And then this contains the remaining chapters of the book. So, those in the, of you in the audience who are interested in seeing what this product looks like, we're getting there. And then, as part of the slipcase set, so you're getting two full color hardcover books, plus you get this Keeper's Screen Pack, which contains a wide variety of items. Okay, and so I'm going to show off these items. Yeah, there are potential spoilers in here, so keep that in mind. You know, if, if, if you are a game master or a keeper and are interested in understanding what's going on with this product, uh, stick around. If you are a player, you may not want to watch forward because this could spoil it for you. Um, but uh, I haven't seen a lot of uh, videos out there of this 7th edition because it was just released. And so I'm hoping to get everybody the information that they need to make an informed decision. So this comes out. It's in this, like, cardboard sleeve here. Okay. Three-part keeper screen, collecting comp important campaign information, covering the cast of non-player characters, travel time, skill improvement. There are uh, updated uh, skill improvement rules for Masks of Nyarlathotep, which you can run as a Pulp Cthulhu game. <coughs> Excuse me. You can run it as a classic Cthulhu game. Um, and so let's open this thing out. So we have this folded over glossy containment device, I guess you would say. So you can keep everything neat. And then we have full color printed versions of all the handouts. Uh, as a keeper of Call of Cthulhu, handouts are such an important part of an investigative game. And so a lot of the money that I've spent recently um maybe i should just do these one by one so a keeper here can make an informed decision about what they're getting with the package as i've been running call of cthulhu over the last a uh, little over a year or so uh uh oh this is really interesting what you know about your friend jackson elias there are a couple versions of that looks like the multiple versions that you can hand out to players so that's a really nice touch because if you're running this with a table of like four to six players um, oh, I see what it is. We have one version of it, and we have an alternate version of it. I think the difference is whether or not you met Jackson Elias in the Peru chapter or not. So that's really nice to have those different variants. Um, I spend a lot of money on printing out full-color handouts for players for my games, and I think it really enhances the game. I really think it's a good use of the money. And so these are all the major handouts from the campaign. I mean, this is a big campaign. Many chapters. And so we have a lot of handouts here to help players get into what's going on. These look really good. This is something that I'd be proud to hand to my players to sort of show them what's going on. Police baffled by monstrous murder. Of course, telegrams are critical aspects of Call of Cthulhu games because many of these games, and this game in particular, takes place in the 1920s. And so there's a little bit of a um, alternate time feel to these games that, uh, you know, what would it be like to uh, 
play a character in the time of prohibition. These look great. Uh, you can get really fancy versions of these handouts uh, from some companies who have been, um, and I'm, I'm blanking off the top of my head who produces them, but there's a company that is producing like a really fancy set of these handouts for I think $250 plus. I mean, people take this campaign very, very seriously. Stars are right. Indeed they are. Oops, don't want to skip anything. Because those of you who want to see what's contained within this, I'm here to help. And they just keep going and going and going because this is a multi-part campaign. we got a stack here to go, folks, and I'm going to show you everything that comes with this so you know what you're getting. We're in the China section right now. Wide variety of handouts, letters. Depending upon where players choose to go, that influences, of course, what investigative clues they'll uncover at different times. But there's a lot of great advice in the, this campaign about moving clues around. I think a big misconception that people have about Call of Cthulhu is that if an investigator rolls and doesn't get a clue, that's the end of the story. No, failing a roll does not mean that you don't get a clue. Okay? It means that that clue moves to a different location, or maybe you only get a fragment of that clue, or maybe it takes you a little bit longer to get the clue. There's all sorts of tricks that Call of Cthulhu Keepers and Game Masters have developed over time to make sure that the story keeps moving forward, but that players also feel that there's a little bit of a challenge. So that was the Peru map, and here's the uh, southern part of Peru. I don't want to talk too much about these um, for spoiler purposes. Nice map of Harlem. This is part of the New York chapter, London chapter map. These maps are beautiful. And people who like Call of Cthulhu, I think it's fair to say that we love our maps. Lesser Dale. Some of my players are reading this. You can probably know where this is going. Wow, this is really nice. A player-only blank version of a map. And I'm going to deliberately... Okay, you know what? The good news is is that there's not a detailed Plum Castle map. Because I don't want my own players to see what's going on there. Cairo chapter. Check this out. It just goes on and on and on. This is a big campaign. Kenya. The route that the Carlisle Expedition took. Nairobi. Tonkar's shop. Things are starting to get grim. What is the Dark God up to? Australia. By the way, Terror Australis was just released by Chaosium. That was a big surprise that, that uh, I didn't know the PDF was going to be released so soon. And it's, that's looking like a beautiful book as well. It keeps going and going and going. Look at all the handouts you get. Shanghai, China chapter. The color on these is just beautiful. Calendar, super important, because this is a timed game and there's a lot of advice with dealing with the time. I won't tell you the reason for, for the uh, time. Now we have some pre-generated character sheets, and these look the best that I've seen. Any pre-generated character sheets that that uh, that have been done recently for a Chaosium product. you got these gr this great portrait, stats of course, but also some pulp adjustments if you choose to go that route. You can play Madeline Brown. An anthropologist, Dr. Arthur Dibden, medical doctor surgeon, Archibald Washington, an engineer, Professor Eleanor Butler, a history professor, classic Call of Cthulhu tropes, Winston Green, an archaeologist, Perry Astor, an explorer, Jennifer Smallwood, a dilettante, Johann Braun, professor of languages, always useful in a, an investigative game in which language is a huge part of it. Pranit Singh Dillon, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, um, a ex-soldier. Francois Pelletier, Pelletier, a photographer. And then we have some blank character sheets, including both the front and back of that blank character sheet. That is just a huge number of handouts. I just have this huge stack of papers here, and I think I'm not going to assemble it now because I don't want to bend or alter any of them. But, folks, we're talking about... Easily 100 pages worth of handouts here. I'm not sure the exact number. Then, 
This is looking good. A beautiful map of the world showing the route of the Carlisle expedition and the different locations that they went to. This is a really authentic feeling map. It's on glossy paper and you can see that there's like stains on the edges as if it's like a real lived in map. That's wonderful. And then the keeper screen. Let's open it up. Classic image of Nyarlathotep from seventh edition book, as well as with some onks and other symbology uh, that could influence, you know, how characters interact with the mythos. This is a really gorgeous screen. This is going to be a great screen to use in addition to the, the normal Call of Cthulhu screen. You get your crazy terror horror on one screen and then your investigation, your investigators on a misty plane on the other screen. Uh, on the inside, we have the Carlisle Expedition members, Information on learning skills and investigator development with a globe trotting campaign, travel time and days between different locations, a huge list of the key non player characters. There are a lot of characters in this campaign. I mean, the text is really small, but I think if you were a keeper and you and you had done your prep for your session, um, what I might even do here, I think, is that oh, you can see well, maybe you can't see, I'll bring it closer. In parentheses, the different characters, there is a uh, they are alphabetical by last name or single name if that's the case, and it also shows what chapter they are most likely to be affiliated with. So that is something that if you are prepping for your game, you'd want to you know, know, know where to look. Tons of characters, okay? A, th a through W, we pretty much uh, covered it all. So that's a beautiful keeper screen that we get. And now, the books themselves. I've had this PDF since July 1st. Uh, I've been consuming it. I've been gaining ideas for my own game because my take on use of published materials uh, over 25 years of being a gamer and, and running games of, from Star Wars RPG, uh, Wedge Star Wars, uh, I, I've been running uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition was was really the first game that got me into role playing, and I know that there are earlier games than that. I get it. Uh, but I've grown uh, through my friends to develop a love for some of those classic games. Um, Masks of Nyarlathotep, uh, from a from a keeper perspective, from a campaign perspective, uh, I I've just been amazed at the care that has gone into the how to of running this game. So I'm going to bust open the book, and so you know there's going to be more spoilers here. So just know that that's coming up. I'm not going to flip through all 666 pages. I just want to give you a taste of the sorts of things that are involved here. So in this first book, we go through chapter four, Egypt. One thing that really impressed me when I was first reading through this, oh, and we have the classic cover of the original artwork for Masks of Nyarlathotep in this first page. I mean, I should be recognizing this because I've had the PDF for a while, but I've been able to read a couple dozen pages here, a couple dozen pages there. Um, when I have a PDF, PDF is not my favorite uh, uh, consumption form of consumption for media at all. I very much prefer hardback books. And so I've read through about, I'd say, two-thirds of this first book on PDF, and I've been gaining ideas for my games. And... Uh, as I was saying, in my time as a role player and a keeper, 25 years of game mastering games since second edition AD and D, I've really come to appreciate this concept of like a hybrid approach to running games. That my own ideas are a fine thing, but I am not an author, I am not a writer, I am a consumer of stories, I love human stories, but it's not something that I'm a professional at. Uh, and at the same time... Um, there are wonderful published authors who have who've written wonderful published things, but those published products are not always going to be a representation of what's going to work for your individual group. And so combining those two things together has, has been my favorite method as a GM. Like I'll pluck some ideas or I will run an adventure, but I will change aspect of adventures in ways that I know are going to be more interesting for my players. And, you know, advice can be good or bad. And, and, uh, there's an argument that we should more be asking people questions than giving them advice. So, um, that is where my area of expertise is in actually as an educator. And so my question for you is under what circumstances 
do you feel most comfortable preventing a story to players that you know they're going to enjoy and are going to meet uh, what they expect out of a role-playing game? And the fact of the matter is, is that running a game directly out of a book probably is not going to give them a full uh, experience based upon their personal likes and dislikes because everybody is different. But to what extent can you make slight alterations to a wonderful published scenario that would allow your characters to have an even better uh, experience? You know, what sort of changes can you make? to make it awesome. So here's a uh, portrait of the Carlisle expedition, where they are. Some of this text is very similar to what's present in the fourth edition, but a lot of it has been expanded. And a big part of the expansion is yes, artwork. There's a lot more artwork in this book and that's excellent, but you get a whole additional chapter in the Perus chapter, which I'll show off uh, uh, the first page of here in a second, but there's just a lot more information about motivation that it did not exist in the fourth edition of the book. Here's the those symbols that we saw on the Keeper screen are symbols associated with the various cults of the um, Nyarlathotep that are present within the campaign that can be encountered in different locations, timeline of key events for the campaign, <coughs> excuse me what skin and then some general notes on running the campaign preparing for play of the campaign what if everybody dies because this is known as a quite lethal game uh and the key non-player characters with in this case pretty small portraits many of these uh, all of these portraits are expanded when you get to an actual chapter but this is just a summary of all the major npcs that exist in the campaign that uh, you follow along pre-generated player characters and how to use them. And so these are the ones <coughs> that you saw in the handouts before. So I'll skip over these because we've seen them already. Uh, so here it is, the Peru chapter. Wow, there's just amazing artwork in this book. So the Peru chapter was added to address one of the main legitimate criticisms of Masks of Nyarlathotep uh, 1 through 4, and that was that the campaign had kind of assumed that the Keeper did some sort of setup for Jackson Elias. There's a very famous podcast, by the way, that is, that is run called uh, The Good Friends of Jackson Elias, and that is an homage to the main NPC of this campaign. And so what they've done in Masks of Nyarlathotep 7th Edition is have added this Peru chapter to give uh, a Keeper an opportunity to not have to do a lot of work to uh, introduce Jackson Elias. Now, you can introduce Jackson Elias however the heck you want. That's entirely up to you, but it's a really lovely addition here that they would take the time to develop a really nice uh, segment. Um, I've read through this. It has a really interesting monster. This is a good opportunity to point out that the start of every chapter has very detailed description of who the various allies are of the player characters with these green portraits, so it's easy to see if you're looking at allies or enemies, and then the red portraits, adversaries. And it has information like, what is their physical description? What do they look like? What are some of their traits that can help you with role-playing? What are some role-playing hooks that you could flesh these things out even more? And uh, so that sort of addition is another major addition to 7th edition that the text of 4th uh, edition, for example, was a little bit more compromised because they had to fit within a word count and a page count, I think, uh, is my impression of the campaign. But here we are really able to take the training wheels off, so to speak. And this is truly a legacy development of a classic campaign. And so that is just a, a, amazing to me. And so the Peru chapter's function is to introduce Jackson Elias to the player characters in a way that, um, that uh, will, will allow them to have some familiarity when the campaign really kicks off in America. And, you know, take it or leave it. It's entirely up to you. There are people who have been running Masks of Nyarlathotep for decades, and maybe you have your own tried-and-true method for how to introduce them, and that's entirely up to you. Folks, the purpose of role-playing is to tell fun stories and to have a good time while you're telling those stories, and that's going to be different for every individual group something to keep in mind. You know, one thing that I think that I want to do here is I'm just going to maybe move the camera in a little bit more so we can get a closer look. Okay, as we're going through. Okay, make sure we're focused. So here it is, the campaign beginning. And 
the campaign has always started off with a message from an old friend. In this case, it's Jackson Elias, and the question is, well, how did you get Jackson Elias involved? A lot of the texts of that Masks of Nyarlathotep companion, that 700-page guide that was produced by fans uh, from yogsathoth.com, deals with this issue of uh, uh, techniques people have used to uh, introduce Jackson Elias. So depending upon whether or not you played the Peru chapter or not, there's two different versions of what you know or remember about Jackson Elias. And uh, various uh, handouts that kick the campaign off, and then the campaign always kicks off in America. And so this is the portion of the campaign where the group is sort of expected to run through it, but there are a lot of va- there are various deviations. So here we have really nice uh, uh, the America clue diagram, how all the other chapters in the book are are connected to America, the different possibilities of different routes the characters could take to get clues and where those clues lead. This is a really useful diagram from the perspective of a keeper because it can be very, very difficult to track the story for a complex campaign like this. But all it takes is something simple like a clue diagram here to make something a little bit more complex a little bit more uh, easier to digest. And so... The America chapter has multiple different possibilities for it. The reason why these are really called chapters rather than scenarios is because you could play three or four different scenarios within one of these chapters. Or maybe you have an, your own little chapter that you want to stick in there. And so here at the start of the New York chapter, we have these green portraits indicating allies. And as we turn the page, we eventually get to the adversaries in red. And so depending upon, you know, uh, what uh, the players decide to do with the clues that they find, that can lead them to different segments of the New York chapter, or maybe they choose to go to a different location based upon a lead. The beauty of Masks of Nyarlathotep is that after America, they can pretty much choose to go anywhere and maybe not do one of the chapters at all. That's really what's going to give uh, players a great experience because they will know that they have the ability to move wherever they want. And part of the beauty of this campaign is that it is setting a keeper up to allow players to make those choices. There's enough guidance and information and enough of the how to here that they will be able to see, uh, have an opportunity. So with a lot of these, um, Chaosium pro- products, the, the newer ones, the full-color hardcover books. We have these lovely marking ribbons, so you can mark off where uh, where you are in the campaign. I'm just going to try to keep that stuck in there if I can. I did it. Okay, this beautiful map of Harlem that goes with the Innocent Man uh, segment of the America chapter. Okay, deals with um, uh, racism in Harlem in the 1920s. And if you haven't yet, I highly recommend that you check out the any award-winning uh, Harlem Unbound uh, supplement uh, written by Chris Spivey's. It's wonderful. So some of these campaign uh, detours are optional. Some of these campaign detours are not. Uh, <laughs> some of them are more linked to the main campaign. And that's a venture. But some of them have more critical clues. So 7th edition stats for all the characters. Nice display of average cultists so that there can be a little bit of variety between whoever your players come up against. Uh, And of course, beautiful artwork of new monsters. The England chapter. Picking up the trail. Here's our England clue diagram. Variety of different chapters. Here in the center of this book is the Route of the Carlisle Expedition. That beautiful map that we saw that you get as an actual physical handout so you don't have to worry about, you know, things being lost in the binding. Uh, there's a major part of the England chapter that includes the Penhue Foundation, which has bankrolled the Carlisle Expedition and what you can find out from that. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here <coughs> because there is a scenario in the England chapter that is one of the scenario hooks that I had pitched to my own playgroup. So I had already (coughs) planned uh, 
a scenario hook for my players that I'm taking out of Masks of Nyarlathotep. Sometime, you know, I'd love to run this game with my own play group if my players are into it and I want to let their decisions guide the campaign. I have so much Call of Cthulhu material to play with right now. If we don't get to Masks of Nyarlathotep, I'm going to have a blast reading it and pulling ideas from it. And if we can get to it, great. So... England chapter is huge, has a, just a wide variety of different uh, offshoot scenarios that you can choose to do. Um, some of them are red herring, some of them are not. Uh, and now we're moving over into the Egyptian chapter. Well, coming up, this is what leads to the Egypt chapter. Okay, because we're concluding the England chapter here with all the NPCs, various monsters. And then here we have the Egypt chapter with the Black Pharaoh, one of the uh, aspects of Nyarlathotep sitting on his Egyptian throne. Classic imagery of Nyarlathotep. Uh, Egypt clue diagram. Lots of different options. Now, I don't want the video to run too long, although I'm sure many of you <coughs> excuse me, would be willing to, willing to sit here for an hour or more and uh, see me go through, you know, detail by detail through all the books, but um, I don't want to do too much here. So there it is. That's the um, first volume that includes through the Egypt chapter. And then the second volume contains all the remaining chapters of the game. Uh, one of these, of course, is the Australia chapter that has been restored into the campaign. It was not present in, in every version of the campaign. And uh, Chaosium just released the PDF of Terror Australis, which contains even more background information about Australia. One of the best supplements that Chaosium has ever put out has been Secrets of Kenya. And so if you can get your hands on Secrets of Kenya, that would help you to run the Kenya chapter. Uh, I believe that there... Oh, there's a, um, there's a Kickstarter that just finished up where a group is uh, doing a, a China supplement, specifically a 1920s um, Shanghai supplement. And so that's a Kickstarter that I backed. So uh, this book contains the Kenya chapter, very similar format with uh, showing out all the NPCs and locations that are present that the PCs might, the, uh, the investigators might interact with. Various monsters and complexes. Ugh, that's awesome, though. <laughs> that was awesome artwork that we just went past. Uh, the Australia chapter. One thing that Chaosium is doing that I really, really appreciate is uh, making an effort. Making an effort. It's not perfect, but making an effort in their modern supplements to be very, very as as respectful as we as we can be to um, uh, different cultures than Western cultures. And so uh, there's a segment here on Aboriginal Australians. And uh, there's an even more fleshed out version of this in the Terror Australis uh, segment that talks a little bit about the <coughs> genocide of Aboriginal Australians by uh, white settlers and uh, speaks a lot about what uh, the perspective of Aboriginal Australians is on the world and how that differs from Western views. And if anything, that just adds... Uh, a, not only a layer of realism, but a request in our hobby that we're being respectful to all cultures within it. Uh, Harlem Unbound by Chris Spivey's is just doing a spectacular job to start and I hope maintain conversations about how uh, race is, is portrayed in role-playing games. Um, and so each cult or each, um, each location in Masks of Nyarlathotep has a cult associated with it th that the players can interact with. And so, don't want to get too spoilerly here, uh, but um, uh, the artwork is just amazing in these books. And this is a product that I I've been searching for as, as a role player for quite some time, and it's part of a game that I love, and it's really gotten a spectacular modern showing and I'm so excited to draw ideas for this and potentially run it uh, sometime in the near future. I already have a scenario seed planted for a part of it uh, in my existing campaign and uh, we'll see what my players choose. 
There are a lot of different possibilities in our existing adventure as to what's going to happen. And depending upon their choices, that's going to guide where we go. I don't have a set plan. The Appendix A is all about travel because this is, <coughs> excuse me, a globe trotting campaign. So it talks about all the different modalities of transport, new spells um, that you can add to the existing spells in Call of Cthulhu. Many of these are folk spells, which is a new type of spell in 7th edition. Um, well, I think it's been around before 7th edition, but it's gotten uh, definite credence within the um, uh, Guide to Cthulhu Mythos Magic. Uh, tomes in each of the locations and what they do. Uh, the odds of your characters not going indefinitely insane in this campaign are is slim, I would say. Uh, there's some really interesting artifacts which, you know, <laughs> when you're dealing with alien cultures, that's something that's always a possibility. And then an index of all the books and where the clue diagrams are located and where all the handouts are located. This is a very useful index, map index. So everything is all separated out so you can check that out. Um, there is also a Sirenscape sound set that has been organized for all of these things uh, as well. And so there you have it. Highly anticipated Masks of Nyarlathotep, 2nd, uh, 7th edition, slipcase set, these two beautiful full-color books, this huge stack of handouts in the keeper screen, all in this lovely slipcase uh, $130 retail. Chaosium does this really wonderful thing where if you purchase directly from the site, not only do you get the satisfaction that you're getting a brand new product from the manufacturer and that you're supporting them, but you get the understanding that they're going to ship it well. You get the understanding that when you purchase the PDF of a product, they will give you the discount on the hardback version of it when it comes out or the softback whatever the particular product was there there are still some softback products um in this line like nameless horrors for example so if you purchase the pdf before the physical product came out i purchased the pdf for these materials on july 1st 2018 and it is now mid-november 2018 when the physical version of this was finally released um I got uh, what I paid for the PDF off of the cost of the slipcase set. So that was kind of nice because I'm essentially paying for this product in two installments. Yes, it's a very expensive product at $130, but I paid $60 for the PDF up front. <coughs> Excuse me. And then that gets subtracted from the final cost of the product. And uh, so uh, it helps me with budgeting it a little bit. But uh, I'm so glad that I invested in this product. It is truly a legacy product that uh, that is a long-standing campaign for Call of Cthulhu. And it's beloved for, for many reasons. And this is the update to Masks of Nyarlathotep that, uh, we, that we all deserve. And it's obvious that so much love and care went into producing this. Uh, and the highlight for me is how much information there is in this campaign, in the updated version of it, for how to run this successfully. And tips for keepers so that they can really do the best job that they, that they absolutely can. The information here is not just who the characters are and what the places are and what the monsters are. The information contained with this is how are you going to knit all of that together into a spectacular storytelling experience for your players. And so, 10 out of 10... Super excited about this, and uh, uh, I hope you enjoy the review. I'm going to have some more things coming at you with RPG Imaginings. Uh, some examples of things that are coming up, I'm going to review Curse of Strahd in a little bit, uh, which is my favorite campaign from 5th uh, edition uh, Dungeons & Dragons, an update to the Ravenloft setting that took inspiration from I-6, the Ravenloft adventure from 1st edition. And so I'm going to sort of do an overview of Ravenloft products that I've collected over the years because Ravenloft is really my main setting for Dungeons & Dragons. I'm going to do maybe an overview of my Dreamlands products for Call of Cthulhu. And, uh, you know, we'll, I have a ton of stuff that I could review on the channel, and so there will be more coming up. And so uh, thanks for watching. Uh, pick up the Masks of Nyarlathotep 7th Edition slipcase set. Uh, it is well worth the money. Thank you for watching.